University. He's the author of several books, including Symbols and Stone, Symbolism in the Early Temples of the Restoration, The Gate of Heaven, Insights on the Doctrines and Symbols of the Temple, All Things Restored, con Confirming the Authenticity of LDS Beliefs, The Plan of Salvation, Doctrinal Notes, and Commentary, Plates of Gold, The Book of Mormon Comes Forth, and the forthcoming Joseph Smith, The Man, The Mission, The Message. I just, I'm going to interrupt right now. I just finished reading Plates of Gold a couple months ago. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was an easy read and a and good, good read. Excellent book. Um, as all the other books as well. The, um, he has published articles in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies on ancient ritual aprons and the Farms Review on the Restoration of Temple Worship. His contributions to the FAIR website include an illustrated paper on inverted five-pointed stars, comments on the Sidney Rigdon theory, and various observations connected to the One Nation Under God's project. Um, there are a number of books of his available in the back, and as I should mention now, as with all of our authors we have here, we have several authors here. If you see their name tag, I'm sure if you bought one of their books, they'd probably sign it for you. So I'm sure he would do the same, yes. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Matthew Brown. Considering the time frame, I'm going to read a whole lot faster than he just did. One bright, beautiful Sunday morning, everyone in the tiny town of Riverton woke up and went to the local church. Before the services started, the townspeople sat in their pews and talked with each other about their lives and their families. Suddenly, at the front of the church, Satan appeared. Everyone started screaming and running for the door, trampling on each other in a determined effort to get away from evil incarnate. Soon, everyone was evacuated from the church except for one man who sat calmly in his seat, seemingly oblivious to the fact that God's arch enemy was standing in his presence. This confused Satan a bit. The adversary walked up to the man and said, Hey, don't you know who I am? The man responded, Yep, sure do. Satan asked, Well, aren't you terrified like the others? The man answered, Nope, sure ain't. Satan became quite agitated at this point and demanded, Why aren't you afraid of me? And the man replied, well, I've been married to your sister for 25 years. <laughs> the man in this story was not disturbed by the circumstances that he found himself in because, unlike the other people in the congregation, he had a unique perspective based upon his own personal experience. This story can be effectively compared to anti-Mormon literature that deals with church history. Some people become aware of the content of antagonistic papers, books and pamphlets and run from the building in a state of terror. Others sit calmly in their seats because they have learned through years of dedicated study that these are not the carefully researched, accurate, and objective publications that they claim to be. They have learned that when it comes to documentary sources related to Mormonism's past, anti-Mormons rarely, if ever, allow their audience to see and weigh all of the available evidence. In my remarks this morning, I would like to focus on how anti-Mormons present a fragmentary, one-sided, and often distorted view of the Prophet Joseph Smith through the selective use of documents. This is a very broad topic, and so because of time limitations, I will only be sharing a small part of the research that I have conducted in this area. I believe that by the time I am finished with my presentation, you will see that while anti-Mormons like to claim that their version of, anti of Joseph Smith's story is historical, it is actually quite hysterical for those who have taken the time to closely examine the relevant documents. I would like to begin this morning by taking a look at certain aspects of Joseph Smith's character. This subject is a prime target for anti-Mormon writers because they believe that if they can demonstrate that the prophet was a detestable, low-life scoundrel, then doubt can be cast upon his claims about the restoration. But in their zeal to attack the prophet's character, anti-Mormons conveniently ignore a large amount of contrary evidence. For example, one recent anti-Mormon book cites a statement made in 1831 by Abner Cole, who said that it was quite certain that the prophet himself never made any serious pretensions to religion until his late pretended revelation, meaning the Book of Mormon. It does not seem to concern modern anti-Mormons that Mr. Cole did not bother to explain how this determination was made or that his statement is directly contradicted by the information on this slide. Here we see that Joseph Smith was raised in a very religious environment. He was taught at a very young age to love God with all of his heart. He learned from the Bible in his home, sang hymns, and participated in family prayers both morning and evening. One first-hand account of what went on in the Smith household indicates that this family was educated under the teaching of the strictest kind of a religious influence. 
But on a more personal level, Father Smith recalled that during his childhood, Joseph Jr. meditated much upon the great things of the Lord's Law. And Joseph's mother remembered that before 1823, he reflected more deeply than common persons of his age upon everything of a religious nature. The prophet's brother William further relates that between 1823 and 1827, he received frequent lectures from his brother Joseph on the subject of religion. Where does all of this leave eyewitness, all of this eyewitness evidence leave Abner Cole's insistence that Joseph Smith was not seriously religious in his younger years? In an indefensible position. Next, there is the anti-Mormon accusation that Joseph Smith's behavior was so scandalous during his youth that church leaders changed his official history after he died in order to cover up his misdeeds and purify his character. The evidence offered in support of this claim is the history that is now published in the Pearl of Great Price, which can be seen on the left-hand portion of this slide. It is claimed that the words highlighted in red were fraudulently added to the text. These words, as the critics are eager to point out, were not in the 1842 version of the church history as printed in the Times and Seasons. But what they failed to mention is that the portion in red was written on 2nd of December 1842, while Joseph Smith was still alive and kicking him, just months after his official history had been printed. In addition, they failed to mention that these words are in the handwriting of Willard Richards, who served as the prophet's private clerk and scribe. It should also be noted that this material is written in the first person, which means that Joseph Smith most likely was the source for these words. But critics take the charge of tampering with this text even further. They point out that the word foibles was inserted into the original manuscript as a replacement for the word corruption. And the phrase, to the gratification of many appetites, though present in the original manuscript, has been completely deleted in the Pearl of Great Price. I would respond that if these editorial adjustments were really meant to cover up embarrassing facts about the prophet's youth, then the perpetrators did a very poor job of it. Since the original manuscript version was, in fact, published before the world in 1842, both in the United States and in England, and reprinted in various pro-Mormon publications in 1878, 1882, 1883, and 1909. Some anti-Mormons have gone so far as to interpret the wording of the 1842 published history to mean that when Joseph Smith was between 10 and 21 years of age, he abandoned himself freely to a variety of youthful vices. But this view is directly challenged by a letter that was published by Joseph Smith in December 1834. In this document, which is reproduced here on this slide, the prophet admits that between the ages of 10 and 21, he fell into many vices and follies. But he refutes accusations of engaging in gross and outrageous violations of the peace and good order of the community. He denies charges of wrongdoing and declares himself innocent of injuring any man or society of men. So what exactly were his vices and follies? He states quite clearly in this letter that he had a light and too often vain mind and uncircumspect walk, and he also says he participated in foolish and trifling conversation. This doesn't exactly sound like young Joseph was the appalling reprobate that anti-Mormons make him out to be. It sounds much more like a teenage boy who doesn't take heed to the consequences of his actions or to the appropriateness of his verbal expressions. What about the argument put forward by some critics that when Joseph Smith was young, he was a teller of tall tales? The argument is made that since Joseph had such an active imagination, he could have easily made up the content of the Book of Mormon and also all of the revelations that he produced. The primary piece of evidence used in support of this contention is a quote from Lucy Mack Smith, which is found in her dictated history and can also be seen on the right-hand portion of this slide. Two pieces of crucial information are typically ignored when this particular argument is advocated. Number one, in the paragraph that directly precedes this quotation, Mother Smith clearly provides the proper context. She indicates that Joseph's stories are connected with the angel and the plates of the Book of Mormon. Number two, about seven years before Lucy Mack Smith dictated this particular statement, she told the same basic information to Wandel Mace, only this time she specified that Joseph's stories were about the Nephites. And she also pointed out that Joseph had learned this information through visions. This detail about being shown Book of Mormon events in vision is confirmed in the prophet's own published history. Therefore, the idea that Joseph Smith was simply making these stories up out of his own act of imagination is not sustained by the available evidence. 
Another favorite assertion of anti-Mormons is that Joseph Smith was a lazy individual who went out of his way to avoid manual labor both as a youth and as an adult. Documents produced by 19th century critics such as David Stafford, Joseph Capron, Daniel Hendricks, and Parley Chase are usually called forth in order to substantiate this claim. This is one of those charges that is hysterically funny to those researchers who are familiar with LDS documents. As can be seen by the timeline on this screen, Joseph Smith was a hard worker throughout his entire life, and he worked especially hard during the Nauvoo period of church history. The quotations at the bottom of this slide should make modern anti-Mormons think twice about putting any stock in the lazy prophet argument. They come from eyewitnesses to Joseph Smith's work ethic. And they say things such as, he enjoyed doing hard physical labor, any kind of work that needed to be done. He assisted in mowing grass with a scythe many a day, putting in 10 hours good hard work. He was strong and active and could build more rods of good fence in one day than most men could do in two. When the prophet's brother William was questioned about the accusation that Joseph was a lazy person, he made these insightful comments. We never heard of such a thing until after Joseph told his vision, and not then by our friends. Whenever the neighbors wanted a good day's work done, they knew where they could find a good hand, and they were not particular to take any of the other boys before Joseph either. Joseph did his share of the work with the rest of the boys. We never knew we were bad folks until Joseph told his vision. In the early stages of the Restoration, critics of the prophet attempted to get people to ignore his message by claiming that he was not a man of truth and veracity. Parley Chase was one of those individuals. He published a statement that declared the prophet bore the reputation among his neighbors of being a liar. Did all of Joseph's neighbors believe that he was a liar? Certainly not. Mrs. Palmer, a non-Mormon who lived near the Smith Farm in Palmyra, said that before the spring of 1820, there was never a truer boy than Joseph Smith. Those people who had close extended contact with Joseph also made note of his honesty. The prophet's younger brother William reports that in accordance with religious training of the strictest sense, the order of the Smith family was truthfulness. William mentions that up until 1823, when Joseph was 17 years old, the family had implicit confidence in what he said. Why? Because he was a truthful boy. William also made this noteworthy comment. He said, I suppose if he had told crooked stories about other things, we might have doubted his word about the plates of the Book of Mormon, but Joseph was a truthful boy. The Knight family had extensive conversations contact with Joseph when he was about 21 years of age, and they found him to be a boy of truth. And in 1830, Josiah Stoll was willing to testify in a court of law that he was well acquainted with Joseph and knew him to be honest. Oliver Cowdery informs us that he interviewed many persons with whom he had been intimately acquainted and knew to be individuals of unquestionable integrity. He learned from their lips that Joseph Smith had been an honest young man, even a young man of truth. And finally, there's a statement from Lorenzo Snow, who knew the prophet intimately from 1832 all the way up until 1844. He said, I knew him to be honest in all his endeavors. I bear testimony of his honesty. What about the assertion that Joseph Smith was a mean kid and a violent adult? Again, these charges are called into question by contrary evidence. Joseph's own mother said that her son was a remarkably quiet, well-disposed child up through the age of 14. Pomeroy Tucker, a non-Mormon who knew Joseph during his youth, recalled that he was proverbially good-natured and very rarely, if ever, indulged in any combative spirit toward anyone, whatever might be the provocation. Lydia Knight in the 1830s and Margaret Young and William Appleby in the 1840s all noted that the prophet's manners were mild and gentle. And just days before Joseph Smith died, he was described by John Bursheisel as having a heart that was keenly alive to the kindest and softest emotions of which human nature is susceptible. In light of these and other testimonies, how should a person react to the claim that Joseph Smith was so violently inclined as an adult that he once beat up a Baptist minister simply for doubting that he had seen Jesus Christ? Answer with a heavy dose of skepticism. On this slide, you will see a quotation from Jedediah M. Grant, one anti-Mormon publication has recently used this quote in an attempt to give substance to the myth that Joseph Smith was a violent man. 
I have highlighted important parts of this quotation so the next time critics of the church read it, they will perhaps have a better chance of comprehending what it says. When this quotation is read with care, it is clear that it has absolutely nothing to do with Joseph Smith beating up a Baptist priest. It is talking in rather colorful frontier phraseology about piety and how the Baptist priest's piety got bent out of shape over the prophet's invitation to wrestle with him. It is true that Joseph Smith defended himself on occasion with physical force and even kicked a man out of his house literally for insulting him and the Lord's Latter-day work. But an 1834 proclamation published by Joseph Smith needs to be taken into serious consideration whenever it is claimed that he was habitually inclined to violence. Joseph stated that it could not be sustained in truth that he had been guilty of injuring any man or society of men. And Oliver Cowdery amplified this statement just one year later by declaring that Joseph Smith never injured any man in either property or person. The last topic that I would like to address in this category has to do with Joseph Smith's morality. Some of the prophet's more unfriendly neighbors in the Palmyra, New York area, claimed that during the time he lived in their midst, he was entirely destitute of moral character. But this charge simply doesn't square with the documentary sources that are available. A non-Mormon named Orson Miss Turner reminisced that during Joseph's time in Palmyra, he helped a juvenile debate club solve significant questions of a moral nature. And in regard to the same general time period, Erastus Snow and Benjamin Winchester said in the church's official newspaper, it is reported that Joseph Smith is of notorious bad character. To this we reply that his moral character before he experienced religion was equally good with any other respectable citizen of the state of New York. This assessment was verified by Oliver Cowdery. He interviewed many people who testified that Joseph Smith was an upright, virtuous young man. And what about the rest of the prophet's life? Was he an immoral person during adulthood? Lorenzo Snow knew Joseph Smith as a close associate from 1832 until 1844, and he made this informed remark. No one who was as intimately acquainted with him as I was could find any fault with him so far as his moral character was concerned. And there were other people who provided similar testimony. Now, I have no doubt that when anti-Mormons look at all the preceding evidence regarding Joseph Smith's character, they will simply brush, brush most of it aside, claiming that the statements made by Latter-day Saints cannot be taken with any seriousness because their views are biased. In response, I would like to point to the documents on this slide. Here we have four instances where Joseph Smith's non-Mormon neighbors in the Palmyra, Manchester area, were interviewed about his character between 1830 and 1835. The men who conducted these interviews were not successful in finding individuals who could impugn the prophet's character. On the contrary, they found that even his enemies had nothing to say against his character. And they were informed that before Joseph Smith received the Book of Mormon plates, quote, his character was as good as young men in general, unquote. The next category that I would like to explore is documents pertaining to foundational events. Again, because of time constraints, I will only be addressing a few of the many topics that could be covered in this category. I have decided to address issues that are related to the first vision and the angel Moroni. The first vision is treated as a subject of great controversy in anti-Mormon literature, and the things that are said about it by critics of the church deserve to be carefully scrutinized. This morning, I would like to briefly examine a few of the many claims that are made about this event, including the alleged unreliability of Joseph Smith's 1838 account of this vision, the claim that the general membership of the church didn't even know about this event until 1840, and the assertion that Joseph Smith joined the Methodist and Baptist churches after he was supposedly forbidden from doing so during this manifestation. On this slide, I have color-coded the information in the two columns so that you can see that each of the main themes of Joseph Smith's 1838 First Vision account are verified in the writings of a non-Mormon named Pomeroy Tucker. In green, Joseph Smith states that there was an unusual religious excitement in his locality which spread to the surrounding region. Pomeroy Tucker reports that the different churches were holding protracted revival meetings in purple. Joseph Smith says he attended these meetings as he found the time. Pomeroy Tucker confirms this fact. In blue, 
Joseph Smith indicates that he became partial to the Methodist sect. Pomeroy Tucker notes that Joseph joined the Methodist probationary class and was actively engaged in it. In red, Joseph Smith states that during the first vision he was told that all the churches were wrong and he was instructed not to join any of them. Pomeroy Tucker reports that Joseph not only withdrew from the Methodist probationary class, but announced that all the churches were in error. In the left-hand column of this slide is another part of Joseph Smith's 1838 First Vision account. The words highlighted in red represent the prophet's claim that he was persecuted for telling other people about his experience. One recent anti-Mormon book asserts that there is no evidence that any such persecution took place and that when Joseph produced his 1838 history, he simply added this material for the sake of drama. But this view is not sustained by documentary sources. In fact, we see three quotations in the right-hand column that effectively nullify it. The first two show that the prophet's parents verified, both verbally and in print, that their son was persecuted after the first visitation from heaven took place in 1820, and that his maltreatment came at the hands of religionists. The third quotation is especially interesting because it reports the words of a non-Mormon neighbor of the Smiths who witnessed the reaction of one of these religionists. This neighbor relates that after the first vision occurred, a Presbyterian church leader came to her house and admonished her father not to let his family associate with the Smith boy any longer. The churchman insisted that Joseph must be put down, or else he would someday convince others to follow after him. This certainly sounds like a form of persecution to me. One recent anti-Mormon publication has argued that the traditional story of the first vision didn't even exist until it was written down in 1838 and wasn't well known among Latter-day Saints until 1840. The theory of Joseph's detractors is that the first vision story was simply invented as an afterthought in the grand scheme of the restoration scam. But on this slide, we see a great deal of evidence to the contrary. From this timeline, we learn that in February of 1830, Joseph Smith's own hometown newspaper announced that he had seen God personally. And in the following decade, Joseph Smith and the missionaries of the church taught Mormons and non-Mormons alike about the appearance of the Father and the Son in a grove of trees in the year 1820. These sources even report that the phrase made famous in the prophet's 1838 account, this is my beloved son, hear him, was generally known. Was Joseph's secret experience related to only a few individuals, as anti-Mormons claim? No. In fact, just the opposite is true. In 1831, the prophet told a crowd of nearly 250 people about this glorious manifestation, and in 1834, he related it in the midst of many large congregations. Anti-Mormons like to point to the 19th century sources that claim Joseph Smith became a Baptist exhorter around 1821, a Baptist convert around 1824, and then a member of the Methodist Church again in 1828. The argument is made that these actions show that the prophet really wasn't commanded in 1820 by the Father and the Son not to join any of the churches, and therefore, he must have fabricated the whole story. Let us take a look at these allegations in their order. First, there's the assertion that Joseph Smith became a Methodist exhorter around 1821. The evidence used to justify this claim is a quotation from Orsamus Turner, which is found on the left-hand portion of this slide. I am confident that anti-Mormons have misinterpreted this source just like the Jedediah M. Grant quote that was mentioned earlier. I contend that this source is not talking about Joseph Smith acting as an exhorter in the evening meetings of the Methodist denomination, but rather the evening meetings that were the gatherings of the juvenile debate club. This conclusion is supported by a newspaper article in the Western Farmer, which announced that the Palmyra Debate Club would begin meeting in the local schoolhouse on 25th of January, 1822. We learned from first-hand witnesses that children around Palmyra were attending school during the winter months and through the end of May. Since school was in session during the same time period when the debate club was meeting, it would not be possible for them to occupy the same building at the same time. Therefore, the debate club would have to meet at the schoolhouse during evening hours. It should also be noted that no anti-Mormon has ever bothered to explain just how Joseph Smith became a Methodist exhorter without first becoming a Methodist. And remember, Pomeroy Tucker said in his book that Joseph Smith did not convert to the Methodist faith. 
What about Fayette Lamplin's claim that the father of Smith told him around 1830 that his son had joined the Baptist Church around 1824? Mr. Lamplin made this claim in 1870, which was 40 years after this statement was supposedly made. This claim cannot be taken seriously since no official record of Joseph Smith's baptism into the Baptist Church has ever been produced, and nobody else ever mentioned this alleged event except for Fayette Lampum. It should also be noted that according to Josiah Stoll Jr., Joseph Smith did not profess religion when he was 20 years old or thereabout, meaning that he did not belong to any church around the year 26. If Joseph had become a Baptist around 1824, we would expect him to declare as much to Josiah Jr. just two years later. Mr. Lampham's memory is simply not supported by documentary sources. There is no verifiable evidence that Joseph Smith ever became a Baptist. Now, what about the charge that the prophet sought membership in the Methodist Episcopal Church in June of 1828? Anti-Mormons tried to support this idea by citing a joint statement published by Joseph and Heil Lewis, who claimed nearly 51 years after the fact that the prophet sought to join the Methodist Episcopal Church in Harmony, Pennsylvania at the same time that he was translating his gold Bible. But as can be seen on this, Michael Morris, the Methodist class leader in Harmony, Pennsylvania, at the time this alleged event took place, stated unambiguously that Joseph Smith did not seek to become a full member. The prophet did indeed attend Methodist gatherings in Harmony, but did he do so with the intent of converting? This is exceedingly unlikely. Why? Because Joseph declared to one of the residents of Harmony between December 1827 and May of 1829 that he was a prophet sent by God to convert other people. More, it is recorded that during Joseph's stay in Harmony, he undertook to make a convert of Nathaniel Lewis, who was the deacon in the local Methodist church and also the father of Joseph and Heil Lewis. Nathaniel said that he would become one of Joseph's disciples if he could test those spectacles that he was using to translate the golden plates. But Joseph declined his offer. Finally, let us not overlook the reference found in Doctrine and Covenants section 10, where in the summer of 1828, the Lord told Joseph Smith that he would establish his church in that generation if the people would not harden their hearts. With this prospect looming on the horizon, why in the world would Joseph Smith need to join any other church? Let us move on now to how anti-Mormons make claims connected with the angel Moroni. In this section, I would like to say a few words about the notion that Joseph Smith had a dream about the angel instead of a vision. The argument that the personage appearing to the prophet couldn't have been Moroni since he, was spoken, he spoke about Moroni. The assertion that Joseph Smith couldn't decide whether to call the angel Moroni or Nephi. And the very strange idea that the prophet learned about the golden plates from a bleeding Spanish ghost. <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> There is a group of 19th century non-Mormon documents that say Joseph Smith learned about the existence of the golden plates in a dream instead of a vision. Critics point to these documents and proclaim that the prophet didn't have a real-world experience with a heavenly being. It all just happened in his subconscious mind. But on this slide, you'll see that the dream notion was formally refuted in the church's official newspaper in July 1835. Oliver Cowdery, who spoke with Joseph Smith before committing his words to paper, referred to the experience as an open vision. He noted that Joseph Smith was definitely awake because he was praying at the time. This experience, said Oliver, was not a dream. The prophet confirmed these points just a few months later when he wrote in his diary that he was not asleep before this manifestation took place, and he classified the experience as a vision. Anti-Mormons, of course, will not be convinced by these statements. They will point out that the church's official refutation was printed six years after the first dream document appeared in print. But as can be seen by the information on this timeline, the prophet had been teaching members of his family and his close associates since 1823 that he had been visited in person by a heavenly messenger, and he classified this experience over and over again as a vision. It is also important to see that on this slide, before the first dream document showed up in 1829, Daniel Hendricks in Palmyra and Thurlow Weed in Rochester were both told by Joseph Smith himself 
that he had had a vision. And David Whitmer heard the experience characterized by the same word when he was speaking with the townspeople of Palmyra in early 1828. Notice also on the upper right-hand corner of this slide that in 1831, two years after the first dream document appeared, non-Mormon newspaper editor Orson S. Turner was not sure whether he should describe Joseph's experience as, quote, a dream or a vision, unquote. When the dream documents are seen in their historical context, it becomes obvious that they really aren't all that impressive. On this next slide, you will see a short quotation taken from the Prophet's 1832 history. Critics like to draw attention to this text because in their mind, if the angel who appeared to Joseph Smith spoke about plates that had been engraved by Moroni, then that angel could not have been Moroni. They see this as evidence that the prophet changed the identity of the heavenly messenger when he recorded this experience again in 1838. But the naysayers fail to acknowledge that these words are not in the handwriting of Joseph Smith. They were written by Frederick G. Williams, who was a relatively recent convert to the church. Since Joseph was telling this story to a scribe who was also a recent convert, he probably phrased it differently than he would have if he had written the account himself. Indeed, it appears that the prophet was explaining as well as reciting this event to Williams. Notice in this text that even though the angel said that Joseph's sins had been forgiven by the Lord, the material after this point is a summary of things that were revealed by the angel. The mention of the plates engraved by Moroni is located in the summary section of this text and is not represented as a direct quotation from the angel. Therefore, the contention that the angel spoke about Moroni is simply a misinterpretation and misrepresentation of what this text actually says. The next topic that I will look at is the Nephi versus Moroni controversy. The primary document of concern in this case is Joseph Smith's 1838 manuscript history. In this handwritten record, the angel that revealed the golden place is identified as Nephi instead of Moroni. When the history of the church was first published in 1842, this designation was retained, and then there were several subsequent LDS sources that copied and repeated the published designation. The explanation for this anomaly is really quite simple. Joseph Smith did not write the section of his 1838 history where the angel is called Nephi. This section is in the handwriting of George W. Robinson, who served as one of the prophet's scribes. As Orson Pratt explained, the Nephi identification represents either carelessness or ignorance on the part of the transcriber. This explanation is supported by the information presented on this slide. It is clear from these entries that Joseph Smith consistently identified the angel as Moroni in 1823, 1830, 1834, 1835, 1838, 1839, and 1842. The dates that are pointed out by the blue lines show that only months after the angel was incorrectly identified in the manuscript history as Nephi by George Robinson, he was correctly identified as Moroni by James Mulholland, another scribe who was working on the church history project. Anti-Mormons think that since Joseph Smith was acting as the editor of the Times and Seasons newspaper when the Nephi designation was published, he would have changed it if he had thought it was not correct. But a quick check of the history of the church reveals that the prophet probably didn't have sufficient time to scrutinize this portion of his history before it went to press. On the day before publication, he was occupied with the legalities of a bankruptcy proceeding. On the day of publication, he was busily engaged in the same type of activity, plus he had to write a lengthy article on baptism for the dead for the very same edition of the paper that was about to incorrectly identify the angel as Moroni, or excuse me, as Nephi. Critics of the prophet believe that if he really thought the Nephi designation was incorrect, he would have published a retraction. But since none was ever forthcoming, they think he changed his mind about the angel's identity. A popular English dictionary from 1828 defines the word retraction as, quote, the act of withdrawing something advanced or changing something done, unquote. Based upon this definition, I contend that Joseph Smith did indeed publish a retraction. The Nephi designation went out in the 15th of April, 1842 edition of the Times and Seasons, and then in the 1st of October, 1842 edition of the same paper, The Prophet, who was still acting as the editor, published a letter written by himself, wherein he identified the angel as Moroni. 
This most definitely is a change from what had been previously done and thus qualifies in the broad sense as a retraction. Before leaving this section out of the lecture, I would like to offer a few, a little brief analysis of the story that claims that a bleeding ghost told Joseph Smith about the golden plates instead of the angel of God. The prophet noted that by August of 1829, there were many false reports being circulated about the Book of Mormon. I would classify the tale of the bleeding ghost among them. There are only four sources for this story that I'm aware of, and they are all very late, being committed to paper between 1870 and 1880. In studying this story, I believe I have detected three separate layers of information connected with it. Layer number one, Joseph Smith's account of the angel Moroni visit. Anyone who is familiar with Joseph Smith's official vision of the events can easily see the elements of it scattered throughout Fayette Lampum's and Joseph and Heil Lewis's accounts of the bleeding ghost. Layer number two, pirate mythology. Lampum and the Lewis brothers speak of a gold treasure that has been buried in an iron box. The hidden treasure is located by taking one's bearings on certain landmarks. The ghost who guards the treasure has had his throat slit. The ghost reveals that he received his deadly wound when the treasure was first buried, quote, in order to prevent his making an improper disclosure about the location. This is tantamount to saying, dead men tell no tales. The only thing missing is an eye patch for the ghost and the theme music from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Layer number three, Joseph Smith's 1825 silver mine excavation job. It is well known that in October of 1825, Joseph Smith was hired by Josiah Stowell of South Bainbridge, New York, to try and help him locate a buried silver mine that had been operated by the Spanish many years before. This is especially relevant because in both the Lewis and Frederick Mather accounts, the bleeding ghost is a Spaniard. And it is interesting to note that the Lewis brothers lived in the same exact location where Joseph Smith was looking for that Spanish mine in 1825. In light of the preceding evidence, I think it is safe to say that the Bleeding Ghost yarn is a blending of three different stories, and I also believe that it was the critics of Joseph Smith who did the blending. No early LDS source ever mentions a bloody apparition in connection with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Elizabeth McCune, who happened to be the Lewis brothers' sister, claimed that she heard Joseph Smith tell the Bleeding Ghost story in the spring of 1828. But it can be seen by the entries on this timeline that the prophet consistently told people between the years 1823 and 1829 that the personage he encountered was an angel of God and not a hemorrhaging specter. The next category that I'd like to talk about is documents pertaining to the Book of Mormon. I would like to examine the charge that the golden plates never really existed, the notion that Joseph Smith didn't originally attach any religious significance to the volume, the claim that the prophet was really the author of the Book of Mormon text, and the idea that Joseph Smith's story of the Golden Bible evolved over time. Proponents of the charge that the golden plates never really existed looked to Peter Ingersoll as their champion. Ingersoll claimed that in the fall of 1827, Joseph Smith confessed to him that he never really actually had a golden Bible in his possession. Ingersoll said that the prophet admitted he duped his family by telling them that several quarts of white sand wrapped up in his work smock was an ancient volume on the pre-Columbian inhabitants of the American continent. Joseph, according to Mr. Ingersoll, told his family that he was forbidden to display the object on penalty of death, and thus nobody ever saw what was really in the smock. Peter Ingersoll's prevarication can be easily dismissed by consulting the documents on this slide. The White Sand hoax reportedly took place in the fall of 1827 when the prophet brought his work smock into the family residence. But testimony from one of the people who was present on this occasion indicates that there was something much more substantial in the smock than just a bunch of sand. William Smith reports that even though he was not allowed to see the object that was inside the smock, he was allowed to hold the package in his hands. And when he did so, he could feel individual plates and also the rings that were holding them together. The other members of the Smith family were also allowed to hold the package on this occasion, and surely they could have told the difference between a rigid rectangular object and a few quarts of sand. Emma Smith, the prophet's wife, once traced the outline of the book as it lay upon a table wrapped only in a linen cloth. She said that she could hear a metallic sound as she passed her finger up the side of those plates. 
It is clear from the testimony of these and other tactile and auditory witnesses that in the fall of 1827, Joseph Smith did indeed possess a set of individual metallic plates that were held together by rings. Now, let's take a look at the related idea that none of the Book of Mormon witnesses ever actually saw the golden plates. It is claimed by critics that since the three witnesses had a visionary experience, they did not view the plates with their natural sight, and therefore, their testimony cannot be accepted as recounting something that happened in the real world. Critics construct this claim using secondhand accounts of things Martin Harris supposedly said. These accounts originated with opponents of the LDS faith, such as Stephen Burnett, Jesse Townsend, Anthony Metcalf, and John Gilbert. In response to this accusation, I would like to point out three of the quotations on the left-hand portion of this slide. Here you will see statements from each of the three witnesses, which were recorded by persons who were not antagonistic toward Mormonism. I have highlighted words that I would like to draw your attention to. Here we see that each of the three witnesses testified, independent of each other and at different times, that their experience was registered by both their physical eyes and ears. In addition, David Whitmer provides this invaluable insight into the nature of the three witnesses' experience. He says, Of course we were in the spirit when we had the view. For no man can behold the face of an angel except in a spiritual view. But we were in the body also, and everything was as natural to us as it is at any time. As the documents on this slide show, the witnesses were careful to clarify that they were not fooled by an illusion, they were not suffering from any type of hallucination, and they most certainly were not having a dream. Modern anti-Mormons claim that as far as the eight witnesses are concerned, none of them saw the golden plates either. They only saw an object that was covered over by a cloth. Really? Let's read together what two of the eight witnesses had to say about their experience and determine whether or not this view can be sustained. When John Wimmer was asked, point Blake, did you see the plates covered with a cloth? He answered, no. Joseph Smith handed them uncovered into our hands, and we turn the leaves sufficient to satisfy us. In this same interview, John Whitmer stated that the plates were a material substance, they were gold, they were heavy, they measured eight by six or seven inches, they had engravings on both sides, and they were connected together by three rings in the shape of the letter D. In the spring of 1832, Samuel H. Smith, the prophet's younger brother, informed a group of people that he was a witness to the Book of Mormon. He said he knew the prophet had the plates, for the prophet had shown them to him, and he had handled them and seen the engravings thereon. The anti-Mormon stance on this issue simply cannot be taken with any degree of seriousness. As a side note, I would like to draw attention to the attempt made by some anti-Mormons to qualify the published testimonies of Hiram Smith and Samuel Smith by appealing to a statement made by their brother William, who did, in fact, speak of them handling the plates while they were covered with a cloth. This is a prime example of the type of hysterical but not historical scholarship that some critics will engage in. William's statement refers to the prophet bringing home the plates into his family in the September of 1827, not to the experience of the eight witnesses which occurred in June of 1829. Anti-Mormons would do well to educate themselves on this point so they will avoid embarrassing themselves by continually employing this bogus argument. Some critics claim that Joseph Smith did not assign any religious significance to his book of gold plates until sometime between 1828 and 1830. They present the writings of such people as Daniel Hendricks, Joseph Capron, Joseph and Heil Lewis to support this contention. But once again, the historical record does not support such an idea. All anyone needs to do to refute this notion is open the pages of Lucy Max Smith's unedited autobiography. Mother Smith reports that shortly after 22nd of September 1823, Joseph told the members of his family about religious worship that was carried out by the ancient inhabitants of this continent, and his recital of these things was directly connected with his encounter with the angel and the revelation of the existence of the golden plates. Mother Smith reports that because of what Joseph told his family at this time, 
They were, quote, confirmed in the opinion that God was about to bring to light something that would give them a more perfect knowledge of the plan of salvation and the redemption of the human family, unquote. As the other quotations on this slide demonstrate, the golden plates were definitely associated with the concepts of religion and salvation during the years 1827, 1828, and 1829. Those who accepted Joseph Smith's claims were aware of this connection, as were those who rejected his claims. In light of this information, it must be concluded that the anti-Mormon argument regarding this issue is not accurate and therefore is not valid. And our Mormons have long argued that Joseph Smith must have been the creator of the Book of Mormon text since he is identified as the author on the title page and in other sections of the first edition. Critics are eager to point out that in the next edition, which was printed in 1837, the prophet's designation was changed to translator, and in their minds this is evidence of a cover-up. But as usual, the critics have ignored several important points in this matter. Both the Copyright Act of 1790 and the Supplementary Act of 1802 referred numerous times to the rights granted to an author or proprietor of a book, but no provision was made in either of these edicts for the copyright holder to be designated as a translator. Translation rights were not addressed in American copyright law until the year 1870. As can be seen on this slide, the only option presented to the applicant in the bottom pre-printed section of the copyright form was to declare oneself as an author or a proprietor. When the Book of Mormon copyright application was filled out on the 11th of June 1829, Joseph Smith was listed in the top section as the author of the volume. This designation is not in the handwriting of Joseph Smith and may therefore have been assigned by the clerk of the district court. But notice that in the descriptive section that was filled out by the applicant, Joseph Smith was identified as both author and proprietor. This means that ultimately the prophet chose to claim all of the rights available by law and to identify himself by both titles designated by law. Even though Joseph Smith was identified as the author a total of six times in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, he also provided information within this very same edition that clarified that what this term meant in relation to him. On this slide, we see that both on the title page and on the copyright notice, the prophet published the same description of the content of the plates which he said he was translated from the last leaf of the unsealed portion of the Book of Mormon. This description, which was written in ancient times, foretells that the modern text would be derived through the process of interpreting the plates. It is further indicated that the interpretation would be brought about by the gift and power of God. So, even though Joseph Smith is identified on both of these pages as the author of the Book of Mormon, it is also specified that the text was derived through a divinely assisted interpretive process. In the other two portions of the 1830 Book of Mormon where Joseph Smith is identified as the author, there are even more specific clarifications of this term. In the preface, for instance, it is indicated no less than six times that Joseph Smith translated the book. It should be noted that portions of the preface were derived from section 10 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And in that section, which is traditionally dated to the summer of 1828, there are 13 separate references to Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon text. And finally, there's the testimony of the eight witnesses. In the 1830 rendition of this document, it is clearly stated that the prophet translated the golden plates even though he is also designated as the author of the book. To recap, in all four documents in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon where Joseph Smith is identified as the author of the text, there is also a clarification that he is the interpreter or the translator. When the prophet was listed as the translator on the, tr on the title page of the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, it was nothing new. I would like to end my lecture by talking for a few minutes about the anti-Mormon theory that Joseph Smith's account of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon evolved over time. The words of 19th century critic Parley Chase are representative of this view. He stated in an 1833 affidavit that in regard to their gold Bible speculation, the Smith family scarcely ever told two stories alike. The credibility of the revision theory is seriously damaged by the very documents that anti-Mormons have used to construct it. On the timeline that is now on the screen, I have plotted out some of the non-Mormon documents that recite what Joseph Smith Jr. and his close associates said about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon between June of 1827 and the year 1830. If anyone 
will put forth the effort to carefully examine the content of these non-Mormon documents, they will see a very interesting pattern emerge. They will see a relatively complete version of the story that Joseph Smith recorded in 1838 and published in 1842. In other words, these non-Mormon documents preserve and confirm the traditional LDS version of events. As an example, I will read you a summary of things that Joseph Smith reportedly said to non-Mormons between 1st of September and 31st of December, 1827. An angel told Joseph where he could procure a set of gold plates. The plates were concealed in a hill south of Palmyra, New York. The plates had beautiful engravings on them. The plates were a record of an ancient people. Joseph found a big pair of spectacles with the plates. In the fore part of 1827, Joseph said he expected to obtain the gold plate soon, and he tried to obtain a chest to store them in. Joseph took his wife at night in the early morning hours to the hill where the plates were hidden. They went to their destination in a one-horse wagon. As Joseph was bringing the plates to his home, somebody tried to take them from him. He knocked down this person and got away, but had several other skirmishes as he continued on his journey. Joseph was severely bruised by one of his attackers. When he finally made it to his home, he was much fatigued. When Joseph moved from Palmyra, New York to Harmony, Pennsylvania, at the end of 1827, he hid the plates in a barrel of beans in order to prevent them from being discovered. Does any of this sound familiar to you? It certainly does to me. If we had sufficient time, we could examine the content of numerous other non-Mormon documents, and we would be able to see the unmistakable elements of Joseph Smith's published history woven throughout each of them. And then, we could explore the content of these pro-Mormon documents, and we would see that Joseph Smith told the very same story to everyone about how the Book of Mormon came forth. We would also be able to see how non-believers added foreign elements to the prophet's story through misremembrance, exaggeration, the perpetuation of rumor, and outright fabrication. I believe that the information contained in all of these documents will go a long way in dispelling the myth that Joseph Smith revised his account about the coming forth of the golden plates, and so I have decided to turn the research that I have done on this topic into a publishable paper. In closing, let me refer once again to the story about Satan appearing in the church. Almost everybody abandoned the building in a state of terror when the adversary appeared, but one man stayed firmly planted in his seat. He was not troubled by the situation that he was faced with because his personal experience had given him a different perspective than the others. It is my hope that all Latter-day Saints will become like this man. I hope that everyone will take the opportunity to study the history of the church and also the life of the leading prophet of the last days so that if they ever find themselves in a room filled with adversarial questions and comments, their testimony will not be tattered and they will not be moved. Instead, they will have the ability to defend their faith because they will have learned how to tell the difference between what is historical and what is hysterical. Thanks. Okay, I honestly do not want to cut into Dr. Paulson's time. And so I will, I will read the questions and see what we can do, but I'm not going to spend some time, uh, some substantial time. Did Joseph Smith have a sexual relationship with his servant girl? Has nothing to do with what I was talking about. <laughs> Regarding Joseph Smith's moral character, how do you explain Joseph's secret practice of polygamy and also his denial of polygamy? I'm not dealing with polygamy today. How do the antis argue with the fact that Joseph Smith's restored gospel of Jesus Christ is growing and going to all the world as prophesied in the Bible. I don't get it. So get back with me later. Let's let Dr. Paulson up here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.